again, welcome to the short oral B session where we're going to have uh, three blocks of three short presentations followed by a discussion. Would like to invite uh, the first, the presenter of the first paper, which is titled MicroPen Multi Class Pseudo Agent for PDL1 Assessment. You can please go ahead with the presentation. Is Jeroen Fermazelen present? I assume he's presenting. I can see now he's a panelist, so he can start the presentation. Jeroen, can you hear me and can you go ahead? Sorry, should I uh, share my screen? Yes, I think the idea is that you present your work in a very short time, 90 seconds. Yes, okay. Sorry, mm, one second. I share my screen. All right, thank you for your time and uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is uh, Jeroen van Maasre. I'm uh, just finished my master's studies and I would like to present to you uh, multi class pseudo edgenet. Um, we um, updated and expanded uh, uh, the novel pseudo edgenet, which is an algorithm for binary nuclei segmentation to multi class. And then we did this for multi class detection, so not segmentation. Uh, and if you, um, and the end, the goal of our research is to apply this multi class to the EdgeNet uh, to find video expression and uh, lung cancer histopathology images. So if, if you look a bit closer to the uh, uh, detection results, you can see we also did a comparison with uh, a YOLO V5 uh, detection algorithm. And uh, in our results, we saw that multi-class pseudo EdgeNet uh, outperforms this YOLO V5. Also, you can see on the right side that this, there is an attention output which uh, uh, supervised along uh, the uh, nucleus edges. Okay, uh, thank you for your time and uh, I'm happy to answer questions later. Thanks, Jeroen. So now we go now with the next presentation and after the first three presentations, there's gonna be a block for discussion. So we'll go to Petr. Uh, well, I will share my screen and then I have a time for a short presentation. Do you see my screen? Yes. Uh, so basically, I want to present uh, the, the, our research uh, with the topic of comparison of different CNN models on the multi standard database. Uh, the main um, contribution from our side is the, uh, this investigation was done on the uh, multi scanner database, which represents different scanners. Uh, the problem in uh, dig digital histopathology is the usage of different scanners, and uh, CNN models usually not. Uh, robust, uh, not deliver the robust results uh, on the different scanners. So we addressed in our previous investigation, uh, the transfer from one scanner to another scanner with usage of different augmentations. And uh, with this research, we address the problem of speed and inference time. So basically uh, we, we made a comparison of robustness and inference time on the different uh, models. So I'm happy to answer your question and hope Hopefully, this was not a long introduction. Thank you. And then we go to the last speaker from the first block. Uh, and that's going to be um, Loris Nani. Is they present? I think I we cannot find him either in, in Gathertown nor in the uh, participants. So let's just maybe move on to the discussion. Okay. For now. Uh, I agree. Uh, if uh, they show up later, we can add them uh, uh, to the next block. But uh, are there any question, uh, questions uh, from the audience, perhaps, about the methodology that was presented in the first two papers? If not, I can start. Uh, 
Uh, I can start with the question to the first presenter, to Jeroen. Uh, Jeroen, uh, you, your paper was developed for, uh, uh, was the motivation to do this um, uh, segmentation task with as minimal uh, with as, uh, as minimal user input as possible for training of the method? Was that the main motivation behind uh, this particular methodology? Yeah, so uh, the motivation was, I think, uh, for a group to uh, start uh, doing research into immunotherapy and then using deep learning to assess if a patient is suitable for treatment. And then since it's very novel, we don't have much data yet. And then the cheapest way to acquire data is via point annotations uh, for this problem, I think. So that, that's the motivation. Uh, we, we started with point annotations and uh, we see if we can do nuclei segmentation using the point annotations. And I'm wondering, like, have you tried uh, off-the-shelf nuclear detection and segmentation algorithms that are trained on different data sets? So how um, do they work on this particular? No, we set? haven't tried. We only have used uh, YOLO v5 detection, and then that was off-the-shelf, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then there is a question from uh, Yannick. Uh, in the chat, I think that's to the second poster, B2, uh, to the second presentation. Uh, and the question is, how do you address different resolutions of the scanners? So Peter, Peter can that's answer that one. I uh, share my screen that you can see actually the resolution of scanners. Yeah, uh, basically each scanner has different resolution, but the difference is uh, not that big it's uh, only the two times uh, difference between two scanners uh, and the original scanner had the resolution in the middle and we try to add zoom uh, augmentations to cope with this uh, with, the, with this difference but uh, it's uh, it doesn't show the big difference in the performance so basically the uh, conversion neural networks can cope with this uh, difference in resolution. We're speaking, of course, uh, about the tissue classification, not about the classification of uh, crypts or uh, about the cell classification, which uh, can, uh, in, 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 in other cases, it, in, it can have uh, the big impact on the results. So in our case, uh, we, we tried the zoom augmentations. It, it, it didn't brought the, uh, bring us uh, the big performance. So basically use only the color augmentations in our uh, routine. And uh, I have a follow up to that. Um, uh, the, uh, I think that the, the, the second scanner that has also the worst performance then it has the, the, uh, the highest resolution. And do you think instead of data augmentation, uh, uh, resampling would have helped in this case to achieve better performance? Yeah, I can I can clarify uh, why the second scanner had the worst performance. So basically, the other five scanners is uh, automatic scanners, and the, this this iStix scanner is basically a microscope uh, with attached uh, camera. So uh, it can produce some regions with auto uh, some autofocus regions, some artifacts. So basically the problem with the second scanner that uh, it has uh, many artifacts on the slides and we address this by adding the blur augmentations and actually in paper I mentioned this, we uh, improved the performance on the second scanner on the I6 scanner from 62 to 76%. Well, basically it's closer to other scanners and uh, in the further investigation for the research we will uh, try to improve the performance in this case so basically the the limitation factor uh, by i sticks it's not the color variations or resolution variations actually uh but um, the uh, the these artifacts on the slide or stitching artifacts also mentioned. okay thank you um then there's one more question for peter from the chat uh, it's from lander and the question is uh do you think if like the, the increase of inference time from one to seven milliseconds has like practical significance in clinical context when you apply this methodology. Well, uh, yeah, well, basically the problem with the increased inference time, of course, that's uh, it increased the total time. We have usually not the one slides, but many slides and uh, it, it, it accumulate uh, with a growing number of slides. And of course, uh, 
the bigger the slides, the bigger the difference. Of course, there is the smallest small slides uh, with the yeah, well, like smallest slides with the resolution like twenty thousand pixels by twenty thousand pixels. But also the bigger slides with uh, many hundred thousands resolutions. So basically, the performance gain on these slides will bring uh, some really good time efficiency in future. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Understood. Thank you. And one more question for Mark, also from the chat. Uh, uh, sorry, Yeroen from Mark, and the question is, did you also optimize hyperparameters for YOLO v5? And if not, can you be sure that the effect you observed can be attributed to this? So yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we, we didn't really uh, optimize these hyperparameters, so indeed, this is something we have to observe later. Uh, but uh, we also see the contribution of having nuclei segmentation in comparison with only point detection. Okay. So, um, thank you. And I think, uh, well, given the delay from the start, uh, this exhausts our time for, for this block of three papers. And we move to the second block. I just a quick check, I believe. My co, co chair is still not present. But uh, then we move to the next paper, which is uh, which is gated CNNs for nuclear segmentation in H and E breast images by I think Shah Benyam, uh, Benyamin is presenting. If I'm not mistaken, uh, can you guys hear me? Please go ahead. Cool. Um, hi, my name is Shauna, and I'm from Rice, perfectly well. Yes, Toronto, under the supervision of Dr. April Kademi. And basically, our objective was to improve nuclei segmentation in breast cancer H and E images, especially for um, nuclei boundary segmentation. As generally, when nuclei are touching or very nearby, um, this can be poorly segmented. Um, so we developed a two-stream architecture called gated CNNs, and here we have one regular stream, which does semantic segmentation, and then a an edge stream which processes edge information in parallel to it. So we can use the results from these two streams to obtain higher quality nuclei segmentation. And so we found in comparison to the UNET and R2 UNET baselines that this architecture was able to have better quality um, nuclei and nuclei boundary segmentations. That's it for me. Thank you. Then we proceed to to you on the in the question block uh, once the other two presentations are done. So the next presentation is uh, uh, called uh, "Strength in Diversity: Understanding the Impact of Diverse Training Set in Self-Supervised Pre-Training for Histopathology Images." A very interesting title. Thank you. Hi. Uh, it's gonna be by. Oh, I'm sorry, I think you cut out there. Okay, I'll- No, sorry, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Christina Cooperschmidt and I'm a PhD student working with Graham Taylor at the University of Guelph and the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence. So the main motivation behind our work is the high annotation costs of histopathology images make transfer learning a very popular technique. Self-supervised learning is a subcategory of transfer learning where the model is pre-trained using unlabeled data from the same domain, um, but instead it completes an auxiliary task where labels are generated algorithmically. Currently, the impacts of cross-domain pre-training are poorly understood in self-supervised learning. So this is really what we were looking into. Um, and we found that there are a lot of inconsistent findings. So the objective of our research was to explore if using self or if using source data from different domains, such as natural images, textures, and different histopathology data sets for simple self-supervised pre-training tasks can improve initialization for digital histopathology. Um, and our results suggest that we were finding uh, comparable or superior initialization using source data from different domains. Um, and additionally, diversity of source data and model performance were found to be correlated for most of our tested conditions. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask or come by my presentation later. Thank you. Uh, I think I, at least I hope I only had some network issues. I hope everybody could hear you well. Uh, for me, it was a bit 
uh, glitchy, but I hope everybody well could uh, 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 yeah hear the presentation. So the next uh, presentation is called Abnormal Detection in Histopathology by Advanced Estimation with Normalizing Flows. It's going to be presented by Nick Pavlovsky. Nick, please go ahead. Hi. Um, I hope you can hear and see me. Um, so my title is Abnormal Detection in Histopathology Using Normalizing Flows, and the idea basically is to use healthy images from his pathology slides where we can get a lot off and train a normal uh, a normality model to see what those um, patches look like and we can then score unseen examples under our density estimator that we can then use to actually say whether something is either healthy or unhealthy and by doing so we can reliably distinguish both those healthy and unhealthy slides and unseen examples and speed up the annotation time needed for actually finding new um, health, unhealthy sites in his pathology images. This is, um, can potentially help a lot with um, getting new his pathology slides labeled and therefore um, diagnosis as well. Yeah, come by my post at least uh, later in the session or feel free to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the second block of three. Um, uh, poster presentations, uh, three short presentations. So, if there are any questions from the audience, please type them in the chat. And we already have one, but better it's for the uh, uh, before uh, paper. And uh, I'm just going to read the question it's which advantages uh, has your approach in comparison to usage of two separate branches for nuclei and borders uh, with shared uh, encoder before these branches? Um, sorry, I'm just going to read that. So this is for the gate CNS paper. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm going to read it again. So the paper is, uh, the, the question is, which advantages has your approach in comparison to usage of two separate branches uh, for nuclei and borders with shared encoder before these branches? Cool. Um, so there actually is another paper that this, our work was inspired from, which is called Gated Shape CNNs for Semantic Segmentation that also uses two branches um, and gated convolutional layers. Uh, so for starters, um, that, that work was done on the Cityscapes data set and we wanted to apply that to nuclei segmentation, but we actually tweaked it in other ways. So we um, use different loss functions and we organize the gated convolutional layers differently um, and other such things, but we, we just basically modified it to work for nuclei segmentation of, of H and E images better. Um, so I can't speak for all other uh, methods, but we just found that this caused an improvement in comparison to the baseline standalone architectures. Thank you for your answer. Uh, we have another question by Yash and it's to uh, Christina. The question is, um, well, thanks for the amazing work, first of all. My question is, how much do you think uh, the number of images matter in comparison to the type of augmentation? Owing to stain and scan variation across sites, it's very easy for SSL frameworks to uh, lead naive solutions instead of capturing morphology. Uh, thank you for the question, Yash. That's a great question. So I think that the uh, the number of images is very important and, and it would have a huge impact on the performance of the self-supervised pre-training. Um, for this specific experiment, we controlled the number of images to be consistent between conditions, but our next work, we are planning on expanding that to try and quantify the impact that the number of images has. Um, and in addition to that, uh, yes, it is very easy for self-supervised frameworks to lead to naive solutions. So in this next paper that we're working on, we're also hoping to incorporate um, more domain-specific self-supervised tasks to try and see if our findings are consistent across um, domain agnostic and domain specific to try and address this question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's one question for Nick. Uh, at one point, the domain appearance variation lead to overlap in the estimated distributions and make differentiation between healthy and unhealthy data difficult. And how could you address this? So generally, this already happens in the work that we are showing, where basically the issue is that likelihood on its own does not separate um, healthy and unhealthy samples uh, very well. And this is something that has been found in the general outlier detection literature before. Um, so we had addressed this with comparing different um, outlier detection metrics. 
uh, where there has been some different work on using something, for example, like typicality um, or other metrics where specifically what we find uh, works the best is looking at the variance of multiple um, density estimators and the variance um, of the likelihood of a single sample across those. And um, this seems to be working relatively well, but happy to go into a more deeper discussion around that um, at the poster. Thank you. And I have, uh, as a follow up to this, a question that arose in the study group uh, this morning uh, about uh, the papers in this session. Uh, this question was sent to me by uh, Herr Ligens. So he, called, uh, he was the mentor and collected them. Uh, well, the first one is like, why, uh, why so large difference between the different metrics? So it basically goes from random guessing to being competitive with super resolution. So as the second question is more or less connected, like why variance does work the best and do you expect this to generalize to that other data sets? Um, good question. Um, the short answer is I don't know yet. Um, I've been running different experiments on, for example, other computer vision data sets, and I've seen it these, like work okay but definitely not as well. Um, and it's hard to give a good, I guess, like intuition around it, uh, why this is the case, um, simply because I guess, well, this is why I put it into a short paper rather than a full paper, if you would understand all of that. Um, again, happy to discuss this. I don't wanna um, take over this whole discussion session, but basically the idea is I'm currently using multiple training checkpoints as in like different checkpoints during the training um, trajectory. And what I'm currently thinking, what might be happening is that basically you get um, some underfitting that is happening, meaning that you get the mode um, of the likelihood somewhere else in your, during your data during the training, and this is jumping around, meaning that you actually get higher variance for the samples that um, you train on, whereas on samples you don't train on, they basically always should have decently low variance, or they sh at least shouldn't change that much. And this is kind of like my interpretive explanation for now, but I am not 100% certain on that. Thank you. Then I have a question also from the study group about uh, the first paper um, uh, about gated uh, CNNs. How do you go from the body and border segmentation to actual instance segmentation of the individual cells? Uh, yeah, so we haven't gone into instance segmentation just yet, but uh, one way to do it would be by finding the um, contours of the nuclei and you can use that to instantiate it. Um, Another way I think is to use a watershed method and like seeds um, and do seeded stuff, but I haven't gotten, in too much, uh, gotten too much into it yet. That's for my future works where I'll be looking at nuclear atypia grading where we have to look at the instances. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's numerous ways out there um, to do that. Thank you. And I think uh, this uh, also in a way answers the second question, which is, uh, did you consider using object detection metrics to evaluate the method as well? But I assume since you don't do instant segmentation, object detection metrics are not appropriate in this case. Yeah, no, not yet. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, about the, another question from the study group about the strength and diversity paper. Did you try to use different data distributions for the SSL pre-training? For example, different number of samples per class or different total number of samples? Uh, yes, we did. But in, in the formal experiments, we just stuck with one um, sample size for this. But again, so our next work is looking at control like that. Um, so we will have an extension paper coming out shortly. Okay. And uh, maybe uh, uh, we're also going to answer the second question there, but uh, uh, that's uh, related to the uh, time the pre-training generally takes. So the question of how much time does SSL pre-training generally take? Oh, sorry, uh, n not the question that's in the chat. Uh, the, no, I have um, not seen that one yet. I'm just asking the ones from the study oh, group. Um, so in because we used a small sample size, so we did our self-supervised pre-training on 4,000 images. It was actually quite quick. It was, uh, I think, like two hours from uh, start to finish for each run. Um, but in future experiments where we have larger data sets, I think it will take much longer. Um, mm -hmm. And then as far as the rotation versus jigsaw question, um, I think this very much relates to um, Yash's earlier question that certain self-supervised frameworks lead to naive solutions instead of capturing morphology. So technically speaking, there shouldn't be um, like a rotational orientation of histo histopathology images, but we are finding that the models are able to accurately predict um, the rotation class. 
So we're doing some more work um, trying to explore why this would be, but it generally wouldn't be because of the morphology of cells. So potentially that could be a reason why it performs worse. Thank you. And I have, uh, I think we have time for one final question and uh, that's gonna be from me uh, to Nick. Nick, do, would you expect the variants also to have the same uh, uh, high performance when you I use an ensemble of methods that were not different time points along the training line, but uh, actually like different random seats or even subsets of the training data. Do you, do you think that I, made difference? I would hope it would work um, for similar reasons that I would hope that like if you have a high enough some number that basically they end up in different modes having covering different spaces of your um, distribution that you see during training. Um, I guess, yeah, I haven't tried it. The issue is like I've been running um, like residual flows that like the training that I've done for have done for this paper already took like two weeks. Um, so I'm training it like on two GPUs. Um, so running this multiple times was just too time intensive to actually try this out yet. Okay, um, thanks everyone again. I think uh, thanks for the nice discussion. I find uh, well. First time I'm doing this and I find it a bit chaotic, but I hope uh, it's clear enough and uh, everybody's uh, well, at least having fun. We go for the last three papers now uh, in this session. And I would like to invite the next presenter that's gonna present the paper, learning to represent whole slide images by Oh yeah, so he's gonna put my microphone is unmuted, but I hope yeah, okay, perfect. So I cannot hear you. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Bill, a PhD student at EPFL, supervised by Pascal Pascal uh, Pascal and this is a joint work with Yunan Zhang. Uh, and it's actually a project that on which we work during Yunan's master's, master's at Altos 4 at EPFL. Uh, here we focus on full unsupervised settings for whole slide image analysis, where high resolution images are available only for some region of interest, some subsets. Um, however, this is not an image-based model. We construct star graphs based on the segmentation output. Uh, here our aim is to jointly learn how to sample these region of interests uh, for the sampling. Um, with more information for a given task uh, and obtain a slide level rep representation and or label. Uh, for this purpose, we use self-identification task as a pretext pre task. And the model is stochastic latent variable with categorical distribution uh, to have this end-to-end -end dis uh, uh, differentiable pipeline with the sampling operation. We train and test our model on a simulated data set because this work actually uh, is tailored for multiplex immune sequencing or multiplex, multiplex uh, immune fluorescence imaging. So it's quite hard to find an open source uh, data set. So we train and test our model on a simulated data set and we will happily discuss our preliminary results if you want to visit our project. I think I'm having some technical difficulties because I could not hear the previous presentation well, but uh, I hope that you can hear me well and we move to the uh, next talk. Next presentation is going to be by uh, Heis Smith and it's going to be on quality control for whole slide images through multi-class semantic segmentation of artifacts. Heis, please go ahead. Thanks. So, hi everybody, my name is uh, Gijs Smit and I'm a master's student at Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, in this work, we present a framework for uh, automated quality control of uh, wall slide images uh, by using the multi-class semantic segmentation of uh, six different types of artifacts uh, that are commonly found in, in wall slide images. And the main motivation for this work is that um, 
um, the presence of artifacts can heavily interfere with uh, accurate diagnosis uh, of whole site images by pathologists, but also by automated deep learning systems. Um, so it can be um, um, really important to uh, automatically localize um, uh, and classify different types of artifacts. Uh, secondly, the, the manu manual inspection of uh, wall side images is really time consuming thanks to the uh, high resolution uh, of, of these images. Um, so it would be, would be also convenient to um, have an automated way to, um, to control, check for the quality. Um, so the framework consists of two stages, basically. Um, a artifact segmentation module, which uh, takes patches of uh, wall side images input and predicts uh, uh, segmentation masks. And secondly, a uh, quality control module, which takes the segmentation mask as input and um, proposes one of four actions uh, that can be used by pathologists or technicians uh, to improve the uh, quality of the slide. Uh, so that was basically um, the framework in uh, two minutes. Uh, thanks for your attention. And yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Guys, and the last uh, Sharma, the Conquer, a framework for end to end multi, in, uh, multi instance learning for whole slide image classification. Yash, please go ahead. Okay. Yes, and we can see your screen. Okay, just give me a second. And do, yeah, can you see my presentation? Like the poster? Just go say hi. The this uh, I'll be presenting a work cluster to Concord in collaboration with all the awesome authors you can see already on the paper. So uh, our primary aim in this work was to basically develop a classification framework in which an uh, encoding yeah. model and aggregation model can be trained in synergy because we know double size are gigapixel size uh, images which can't be trained uh, using traditional approaches directly. So we need to patch them and use a multi instance learning framework to model them. So we want and traditionally both the stages of training has been done in, in a disjoint way in which encoding and aggregation model is trained separately. So in this work, we attempted to train them together in synergy. Our hypothesis is by training them in synergy we get better results so we uh, like we use a clustering based sampling approach for training and we use adoptive attention pooling for aggregation uh, being included a kl divergence loss which i'll explain quickly in a second for uh, to uh, penalize uh, our model if different uh, attention weights are allotted to patches coming from same cluster so we observe that end-to-end -end training is has the potential to do better than two-stage disjoint training we observed that ResNet 18 trained using C2C framework did better than ResNet 34 and 50. Our hypothesis is that this is because of the synergy between the aggregation and coding module. And I'll uh, quickly explain. So what basically happens in the framework is that at the side of each epoch, our encoder, which is being trained in each epoch, is used to create get the embeddings for all the patches. And we did use k-means clustering to divide them into k buckets. For each WSI, we run k-means clustering separately to avoid any uh, clustering-based issues because of global clustering or same issues. And we divide them into k buckets and we sample k dash patches from each bucket. We sample in short 64 patches from each WSI to make the WSI training computation retractable. And during the epoch, we trained it using cross entropy losses and KL divergence losses. What we did, why we included KL divergence loss, we included KL divergence loss along with cross entropy loss to ensure that patches coming from the same cluster get the same uh, weight, same. Uh, same distribution of weight. So if you see the diagram on the left on the top, you see if when we have not included KL divergence loss, we tested it on our MNIST bag data set we, where we created a bag of MNIST numbers and said the bag is positive if it either contains eight or nine. So we observed that when we train it using just back loss, means cross entropy loss of zero one, the weights allotted to different numbers are very random. And when we include instance loss also, then also the weights, either it randomly picks up eight or nine and give higher weight to them. But inclusion of KL divergence with KL divergence between the weight allotted to class eight and nine and uh, the cluster and the uniform distribution, it reg regularizes the attention weight given to each of these classes and see now the weights allotted to eight and nine is more uniform and is more consistent because those are the positive essence. And we can see some of the good examples because no paper get published without good examples, uh, highlighting that this approach works. But yeah, that's all from my end. Please, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Yash. Um, then, if you have any questions, please um, type them in the chat. Uh, also, for uh, this set of three papers, there was uh, 
questions that are also from the study group. So I'm going to start uh, with the question to you, Yash, since you're already uh, in the screen. So, uh, and this is a question that I also had when reading your paper. So how does your method differ from uh, the CLAM model? I'm not sure if you know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, which I, also a similar mechanism and also a clustering uh, method. Yeah. yeah, that was a pretty impressive paper. I read it. Uh, we read it during the development and later also. So the CLAM paper use a pre-trained encoder. Which they never fine-tune their encoder. They use pre-trained encoder. And the the beauty of using a pre-trained encoder is that you can you you can get the embedding representation for all the patches and use something like adaptive attention pooling that we used over it. So there you have the. There you have the flexibility of playing with different pre-trained encoders such as ImageNet or something developed by SSL by Christina because I experimented with those kind of experiments. In our case, we also fine-tuned ResNet 18 and ResNet 34 encoding module also for the patches because that can't happen when we I consider all the patches from a developer. So I need to have a batch size of 64, 128, something that is GPU digestible and computationally tractable. So that's the major difference between CLAM and our approach. If it answers the question, thank you. Uh, I think for it does. Uh, it explains what the difference. And uh, also from the study group, it's about the quality control of host lighting. 